morning, Refuge. <laughs> you know, it feels like today we're getting hit pretty hard. The enemy's striking us down. Um, we have a lot of people who are sick today and not feeling well and, you know, just all sorts of things coming against us. And so um, I just want to say a quick prayer before we go into worship. Father, that you would be with those who were not able to be with us today, that you would minister to their hearts, Father, and um, speak, to, to speak to them in a way that ministers to them personally. Whatever they're going through right now, we ask, Father, for a blessing. And we ask for this time to be a time of joy. Help us, Father, to truly, truly worship you, give you thanks. We're so excited to be here in your presence. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up to our feet. Joy. Let's have joy. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh, I won't be shaken no oh, I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I
cross how precious is my Savior's blood the beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame the image of love upon death's frame Having my heart was worth the pain. What joy could you see beyond the grave? Love found my soul worth dying for. How wonderful, how glorious. My Savior scars, victorious. My chains are gone. My debt is paid from death to life and grace to grace. That tore through hell like a rose. The promise that rolled back death and its stone. If freedom is worth the life you bring, where is my sin? Where is my shame? Jesus, 
Oh 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, that we can proclaim that with no fear, with no shame. You are our Lord and Savior. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this day that you've given to us. And we pray, Father, that we could use it for your glory. Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts right now for the message that we're about to receive. That, Father, you would bless the lips of our pastor. That we would hear your words coming through his mouth. Father, that we would have the ears to receive what it is that we need to hear this morning. And that we would leave here changed and glorifying you. Thank you for all you're about to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes I go bad, man, bad. Wanna check out my mind, no cops can. It's a 911 bill, I'm done. Never yeah, finna lose it on the lap, man. But when I see my nigga, open the bottom and you go see that wada, wada. Send me free like wala. They be like a line, like Jesus or not, bruh. Yeah. Jesus or not. Jesus or not. Jesus or not. It's all love for the Jesus or not, bruh. Jesus or not. Jesus or now, nah, nah, nah. Jesus or now, it's all love, but Jesus or now. He wrote my intro and I was really out drunk. First the sin going down, I'm letting doubt go. It's been the fucking road, but I'm finna walk it out, go. I'm really seeing what Jesus is all about, go. The devil has God bless the block. Newport bottle in a bundle. On a rooftop party to the gun blow. But he promised to finish with even gun go. You know the line to do the life's a jungle. You know you lost somewhere and else a gun go. That's why the cross is there, y'all can come go. That's why the cross is there, y'all can come go. I got a drop back shot like Steph Curry. Double S sword and get your neck dirty. Devil did me foul, I don't blame it on the referee. Jesus hit the free throw, the rest of his history. What? What? Jesus or not? Jesus or not? Jesus or not, it's all love, but it's Jesus or not, bruh. Jesus or not. All right, all right. Well, I guess you can tell it's toy drive season, so <laughs> um, it's, it's a, a great time of year. Um, it's something that we've been doing for about 12 or 13 years now. Um, we've been connected with Neighborhood Hope Dealer, and uh, um, we'll be on Phoenix Drive on Christmas morning. I know that it's sometimes that's an inconvenience for people because we know you want to be home with your families and, and to do all the gifts and all that. But I think the greatest gift we can give people is ourselves and being out there in the streets and, and sharing God's love with, with this, the, this population that we work with. And so I'm super excited. I thank you for all of you who have stepped up already to help out, Dennis and Chris and a few others who have labored out there to get bikes on uh, Black Friday, and so I know that was a nightmare, And uh, <laughs> but uh, God is so good. Um, we have a toy barrel in the back if you want to just drop off a toy. It doesn't be, have to be wrapped or anything. Just throw it in the barrel. We'll take care of it. Um, if you want to give uh, to the toy drive, um, you can write a check out, and we'll specifically make it for um, Neighborhood Hope Dealer and for the toy drive. And so, uh, again, man, I mean, it's just an exciting time of year, and I just want to encourage you to come out. And, uh, and support this and be a part of what we're doing. So, <clears throat> joke? Okay. Hopefully I'll get this one right this morning. Because, I mean, you guys are my, <laughs> you're making it hard for me, man. Because i got to spend as much time finding a joke as I do working on my message, right? So, 
<laughs> okay, so I actually found this one this morning. I was actually looking for it. It didn't come to me. But after I saw it, I, this is kind of funny. So, of course, I have a warped sense of humor. So you guys may be like, yeah, pastor, man, you're losing it. You know, uh, go take some Benadryl or something. I don't know. So it goes like this. So this, this lady walks into the veterinarian's office, and she's got this limp duck, duck in her hand. And so the vet says, man, you know, or the receptionist says, here, go into waiting room number one. And so she goes in there, and she lays this limp duck on the, on the examination table. A couple minutes later, the vet comes in, and she says, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's, he's just laying. He's just been limp all morning. And so he walks over, and he starts looking at this duck, and he pulls out his stethoscope and puts it on the chest and listens, doesn't hear a heartbeat. And he says, ma'am, I'm so sorry, but Cuddles is dead. Cuddles is gone. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. She goes, what do you mean there's nothing you can do? You haven't even done anything. You just, you just listen to his heart. Maybe he's in a coma or something. And she said, you know, you didn't run any, you haven't run any lab tests. You haven't done any, any, any uh, blood work. You haven't done anything. And so he just looks at her and rolls his eyes and walks out. A couple minutes later, he brings in this black Labrador retriever. And so the dog walks up, man, boom, pops his hand, the little paws up there on the on the examination table, he sniffs the duck and everything. And after about a minute, he looks at the vet with tears in his eyes and shakes his head, drops down and leaves. Vet goes back outside, man, grabs his cat, brings a cat in, puts it up on the table. The cat starts sniffing this, this duck and licks the duck and everything and shakes the duck and, and nothing. And, and the cat looks at the vet with tears in his eyes and shakes his head like this and jumps off the table and leaves. And so he says, ma'am, I'm sorry. He says, done everything I can do, man. He says, Cuddles is dead. So he reaches over to his computer and pops a button, and a receipt pops out, and he hands it to her. And she goes, $150 for you to tell me that my duck is dead? You're charging me $150? This is highway robbery. He says, ma'am, if you'd have listened to me the first time, it'd have been $20. But with the lab tests and the CAT scan, it's $150. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, you guys are making me work too hard, man. So if you haven't guessed by the Christmas trees and the Christmas trees and the Hope Dealer video, Christmas is upon us. It's here. Whether you like it or not, Christmas is here. And when you hear the word Christmas, what comes to mind? What do you think about? Do you think about the presents? that are underneath the tree or the presents that you're going to give people or maybe the presents that you're going to get, right? Do you think about the lights? You know, everything's lit up. Come to my house, it's Griswold City, right? Maybe you think about Christmas carols, right? The songs that are associated with this time of year. Parties, man, it just seems like every time I turn around, there's a party we got to go to, you know, right? All of you, I mean, you're going to parties all the time. Or maybe when you hear the word Christmas, you think about the wise men and the angels singing. Maybe you're like the great theologian Ricky Bobby. And you think of deer, eight pounds, six ounces, newborn infant Jesus, who don't even know a word yet, right? Now, maybe that's what you think of. Ricky Bobby, man, he's a great theologian, right? For some of you, man, it's drudgery. For some of you, it's weariness. For some of you, it's frustration. And for a lot of people, it's sadness and loneliness. This can be a very lonely and sad time of year for people. Christmas brings out a myriad of emotions and thoughts and thinking, and it's here. For the next month, this is what we're going to have. This is what we're going to be dealing with. And today, we start a series that I titled, Tis the Season. And my prayer is that we would better understand why we celebrate Christmas. Why do we celebrate it? And also, why certain things are mentioned in the Bible about the birth of Jesus. We read the Christmas story in Luke, or we read about the Christmas story in Matthew. And I think we seem to... And I may be misinformed on this, but I think we seem to miss the significance of what is being penned in the Bible. 
there's a significant part of what Luke is writing about that we need to understand today. And so this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And it reads, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So before we get started, because we're talking about one of the most significant events that have ever happened in the history of mankind, I want to really position ourselves this morning with God. The worship, thank you team, the worship was awesome this morning. But man, we need to get our hearts positioned for God. We need to get our, our, our minds focused and set on God this morning. Because we're distracted by a lot of things, man. Th even this morning, this Sunday morning, we were distracted by all sorts of things, man. We weren't focused on what we're supposed to be focused on. When we come to the house of the Lord, for me, when I come here on Sundays, I want to be focused on this. I want to be focused on him. And I get pulled in different directions sometimes. And it's uncomfortable. But one thing's for sure is that God wants us to focus right now. And so, Lord, we come to you with all of our being this morning. Everything that's in us, God, we want to bring it to you. We want to present it to you. Lord, we want to seek out the God of the universe, the creator of all things. The one who left what he had in heaven and came to earth as a man. We want to, we want to seek out Jesus this morning and understand who Jesus is this morning. And have a closer relationship with Jesus this morning. Lord, I pray for all the sin and lies that are in this room this morning, God. All those things, Lord, that are in us that we need to get rid of our sinful minds, our lying tongues, the lies we tell ourselves, God. Lord, we want to lay it at your feet today and be totally empty of ourselves so that we can encounter the God of the universe, our Savior and King. So, Lord, I pray for all those with an earshot of my voice, Lord, and all those who can't hear my voice this morning, all those in the Bible believe in churches this morning, God, that you would encounter them in a powerful way, God, that your spirit would wash over them, Lord. That, Father, for the next 30 or 40 minutes, God, the only thing that we want is you. Nothing else matters. Nothing. So help us to understand, Lord, who you are and what you've done for us. And it's in the mighty and magnificent and marvelous and majestic and incredible name of Jesus we pray. And all the church said, amen, amen, amen. So we see this story that unfolds in Luke. And when I hear this verse, or when I read this verse, now y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but I think of the Charlie Brown Christmas. I think of when Linus, in the Charlie Brown Christmas, he tells the Christmas story, man. Now, growing up in the 60s and the 70s as a kid, you didn't have thousands of, of Christmas shows and things that you could do on demand. Like if you go to Xfinity right now and say Christmas in the remote, it'll bring up literally like 1,100 and something Christmas shows and all that. We didn't have that man back in the day, right? We had the big three. Does anybody remember what the big three were? No, no, no. I mean the big three Christmas shows. Huh? What were the big three Christmas shows? Let me tell you what they were. A Charlie Brown Christmas, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and... Frosty the Snowman, baby. I mean, we lived for that. As a kid, man, they all came out about the same time, like around the mid-60s and stuff, and we lived for it. And you know what? They would put them all on the same night, and boy, you'd just be waiting in anticipation. And it wouldn't be like till December 23rd that they would come on, like, why do we got to wait so long, you know? Come on. But man, as a kid, we would just anticipated Christmas. Think about your memories as a kid. And how Christmas was such a big deal to you. It was a big deal to me. It was the only time in my life from Thanksgiving to New Year's where it was some normalcy in my home, right? It was like something magically happened in my home. And suddenly from Thanksgiving to New Year's, everything was, seemed okay. 
And even when I was kicked out of my house and I was living on the streets, I could still come home for Christmas. That's the crazy thing. It was like everything was forgotten. I could still come home. As dirty and as raggedy and as tore up as I was, I was still walking to my house during that time. Christmas had a special meaning. But why do we even celebrate Christmas? Why? How did this whole thing even start? And the biggest question that I get from people is this. How do Christians celebrate a pagan holiday? Because isn't Christmas pagan? Well, I want to take a look at that this morning. I'm going to look at if Christmas is really a pagan holiday. Now, let me begin with this. Nowhere in Scripture are we told about a celebration commemorating the birth of Christ. There's nothing there. Nothing in Scripture gives us any sure evidence about the date of when Christ was born. This is totally opposite about his death. All four gospel writers write about the death and resurrection of Jesus. We know the date of Jesus' death. It's not hard to figure out. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We know when he died. We know it. We know the date. So if there's nothing in Scripture telling us to celebrate the birth of Jesus, then why do we do it? Well, let's go back in history, (laughs) where we always have to go. The first church figure to discuss the date of Jesus' birth was Clement in 200 A.D. He was an Egyptian preacher from Alexandria. Some believe that John the Apostle had actually um, had an impact on him through his writings. Of course, John died 100 years before Clement, but John's writings had an impact on him. And he believed that since Jesus died at Passover... Did he not die at Passover? He did, right? That he was born around Passover. And originally, the date of Jesus' incarnation or conception was the focus, not his birth. In, in Jewish culture, in Jewish life, it's, it, life begins at conception for them. That's why, the, that's why the Jews don't really celebrate birthdays and all that. That's how the Jehovah Witnesses got outside. It's not because they don't celebrate birthdays in the sense that you can still say happy birthday and stuff. But they believe that it's the conception that is the most important thing to remember. So how did Clement arrive at this conclusion? Well, surprisingly, the early church followed a very Jewish idea. And this idea is this, that the beginning and the end of important redemptive events often was around the same date. Okay? Let me give you some examples. In the Jewish verbal Torah, the month of Nisan, which is March, is the most significant month of the year for them. Why? Because they believe that the month of Nisan, or March, was when the world was created. They believe that it's when the patriarchs were born. They believe that Nisan is the month that the patriarchs died. They believe that Isaac was born on the Passover date. They believe that Rachel, Hannah, and Sarah were remembered by God and they conceived their sons in the month of Nisan. In Nisan, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt, which is true. They were redeemed in, the, in that month. How do we know that? Because that's when Passover started, right? And they also believe that in Nisan, the future Jewish people were redeemed in the final redemption. So that's what it's based on. Again, understanding the history. You got to understand the history. So the early church fathers had speculated about Yeshua or Jesus' day of birth for hundreds of years. They had wondered, When was the Messiah born? And more importantly, they wanted to know the day of his conception, the true moment of the incarnation when God blasted into humanity in the womb of a woman. Now, shortly after Clement, another early church father by the name of Tertullian, he took Clement's theory 
And based on that theory, he came up with this, this thought, which is this. Because he knew precisely when Jesus died, which was the 14th of Nisan, or in the Gregorian calendar, it's the 25th of March, okay? Because remember, the Jewish calendar runs off of a 28 to 30 day cycle. We run off of typically a 31 day, some months that don't have 31, okay? He said he knew exactly when Jesus was conceived. So the logic in what, what Tertullian was thinking is this if Jesus was conceived on March 25th, then counting forward nine months of Mary's pregnancy would place his birth on December 25th. And this is especially intriguing, church, because January 1st, for a thousand years, was celebrated, right, as the day of Christ's circumcision, which was eight days after his birth. Remember that the Jewish day starts at 6 o'clock at night and runs to 6 o'clock the next day. So in reality, Jesus would have been born at night on the 24th of December. Going forward eight days would put us on the first of the year. Okay, pastor, thanks a lot for all this jibber-jabber data. I could care less. How did we get to the point where we're at with Christmas? Why is it considered pagan? Well, there was a dude named Aurelian. He was an emperor in 24, or excuse me, in 274 A.D. He established December 25th as a festival of what? Does anybody know? Sol Invictus, which was, a, 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 it was worship of the sun. And basically, it was based around the winter solace, right? Because winter, when winter starts, is typically the shortest day of the year. And so what this emperor wanted to do was, was promote the fact that even though the sun is not shining as much as it, as it does during the summer months, the sun is still relevant and it's there and it hasn't lost any of its power. Now, here's what you need to understand. By this time in 274, Christians had already began to tap into pagan ceremonies and celebrations for what reason? It wasn't to be like them. It was to evangelize them, right? It's to evangelize them. They would tap into these celebrations to do that. It's like people used to think that I had lost my mind when I was a director of Youth for Christ and Halloween would come and I'd be all fired up about Halloween. Halloween don't bug me at all. Man, it, it, Satan can't touch me. We would, get, we would charter buses. I'm not even kidding you. Three or four buses. We'd take like 150, 200 kids to Fright Fest out there at Six Flags, right? It cost them like 75 bucks. It included your bus ride, your ticket in, you got food that night, right? And we'd take them over there, man, we'd freak them all out. Oh, it's scary, yeah, you know? Then we'd load them back up in a bus, and we'd drive back to Sacramento, and we'd take them to a cemetery. We'd roll into the cemetery, right? It's all dark and everything, and they're all freaked out, Woo, you know, and we're, and we're pumping it up, boy, we, you know, and we'd get them off the bus, and we'd take them over to this big, big mausoleum tomb thing, right, and then poof, we'd throw lights on, and they'd be like, what's going to happen next, you know, and we'd tell them, yeah, this night's real, man, there are demons, there are, there are weird things that happen, man, there are spiritual things that are happening behind the scenes that we can't see and then we give them the gospel message man and we'd all we tell them the same thing every one of us are going to end up here we're all going to die we're all going to die man we'd have kids snot face crying coming to jesus man it was awesome man right it was so cool how could you do that pastor how could you i'm it's like why not do it right I was never a harvest festival guy. I want to reach the lost. We need to teach our kids how to deal with the world and the lost. When you isolate them from the, lo from the lost, when you isolate them from the world, they don't know how to handle it. I was at a harvest festival one time. I don't know if mom ever remembers this. And there was kids from the neighborhood showing up in all these spooky outfits and stuff like that. They were turned away. And I'm thinking, they need to be here. They need, to, they need to feel what we're feeling and witness what we're, what? We can't do that. That's demonic. I 
bet you what you watched last night was demonic. Shut up. Sorry about that. Let me step off my high horse here. <laughs> so this emperor, he brings this, declares this day, December 25th, to be Sol Invictus. And here's the thing. A lot of Christians have been taught that, that it was this, this emperor and Constantine that, that combined Christianity and in in, in, in the celebration of Christ's birth with this, this paganism. But it's not true. That's not true. That's not what happened. In fact, many early scholars believe that this emperor, the reason that he decreed the 25th as Christ, is the Christmas, day, uh, Christmas day, or excuse me, the date for Sol Invictus, was that he was trying to stamp out what the Christians were already celebrating, which was Christ's birth. Church is important. We understand what we believe and why we do certain things. So before answering my question, is Christmas a pagan holiday? I think we should answer a few related questions to it first. Number one, is Christmas a biblical holiday? No, it's not. It was not commanded by God in the Bible. It's not like the Feast of the Tabernacles, right? It's, 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 it's not Hanukkah. It's not these things. Does the celebration of Christmas contain elements that are pagan in origin? Absolutely they do. They do. There's, there's no doubt whatsoever that they do. Is December 25th the correct date for celebration of Christ's birth? Possible. But I think it's unlikely. Okay? That's a whole other story. And finally, is Christmas a pagan holiday? Well, let me just give you this statement, and you can take it to the bank. There's nothing pagan about speculating that December 25th is the birthday of Jesus. Inaccurate? Probably is. Pagan? No. I don't believe it is. And so I hope this brings some clarity to this subject about Christmas and Christians participating in Christmas and all that. And, and, and one other thought I have here real quick is, you know, there's differences of opinions on how Christians to celebrate Christmas, right? Can you have a tree? Can you have lights? Can you listen to Chris, Christian or Christmas music that isn't Christian? Can it be secular? I mean, all good questions, church, but here's the thing. Let me ask you another question. What is your heart? What is your heart? Because, man, do you really separate things like that in your life? Because I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of things you do that you don't bring Jesus with you or that you can't. Now, trust me, I'm telling you the truth. Right? I know i got to check myself on that. But over this situation here, we've all suddenly got Christian guidelines on what we can and we can't do. Let me tell you something. I love the Christmas tree. You know why? It reminds me of the beauty of Christ and who he is. And when my wife decorates the tree, whoo, man, Mama Bear, you got a little domestication in you. It's pretty good. Right? I love the Christmas lights, man. I, I think it's beautiful when you drive down the street and it's all lit up. It's awesome. Reminds me of the glory of God, the light of the world. When you look up at the stars, you go, wait a minute. That's, that's too many lights. No. I love Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. I will play that song every single day. I love that song because it tugs at my heartstrings. Now, little do people know that song originally had the word Lord and God in it, and they took it out for the movie Meet Me in St. Louis because he said, don't know if people are going to like that too much. Listen, celebrate Christmas the way you want. Stop judging what everybody else is doing. I don't care how you celebrate Christmas. I don't care. I will celebrate Christmas the way I want to celebrate Christmas, and you celebrate it the way you want, and let's just all be good about it. Because everybody does it. For, everybody celebrates for a different reason. So now we see how we've arrived at celebrating Christmas. Now let's look at a few important things mentioned in the Christmas story in Luke. If you go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 7, can you bring that up again, Mama? 
It says that she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Luke tells us that Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He also tells us that Jesus is in a manger. So today I want to look at Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. Why is that there? If it's in the word of God, then we need to understand why it's in the word of God. We need to understand the significance of what Luke is pinning in this verse. Now, according to Luke's birth narrative, which we just read, Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, this Greek word here for swaddling is only used a few times in the Bible, right? And only a few times in the, in the, uh, the Hebrew Torah. And it says, and, and they laid him in a, in a manger. And then later in verse 12, and we're going to see this in a few weeks, Luke writes that an angel describes the scene to the shepherds, saying in verse 12, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So Luke first pins it gives us that information, and then he makes sure that we understand that the angel said the same thing to the shepherds. Why? Why does Luke repeat this seemingly mundane act of Jesus being in swaddling clothes, and why does the angel call the, the Jesus in the swaddling clothes a sign for the shepherds? Why does he do that? Again, you got to understand the Bible and how it's written. You have to understand the origins of the Bible and why things are penned. In, in the Jewish culture and also in the Hellenistic culture, which was uh, Gentiles who became Jews, okay, if they read this verse, if they heard this verse, It denoted human kingship and divine supervision. Luke refers to swaddling clothes in order to highlight Jesus as the royal son of David and the anointed one of God. Now, how do I know this? How do we know this? Because it's written somewhere else, right? There's nothing in the New Testament that isn't written somewhere else. Now, as I've shared with you before, There's a lot of things that are in the New Testament, a lot of writings that are in the New Testament that are not in the canonized Bible that we have today. For instance, when we were looking at the book of Romans and we were in chapters 9 through 11, if you remember the quote about Abraham being a man of faith, Paul was actually quoting out of Maccabees, a book that's not in the canonized Bible, but a book that has that was used by the early church in order to establish things about God and Jesus. In the Jewish book of wisdom, which was written by Solomon, this went along with his writings in the, of the book of Proverbs, he says something very interesting in the book of wisdom. He says this, I, speaking of himself, was nursed with care in swaddling clothes, Now, that same word swaddling clothes in the translation in the Septuagint from the Torah, the the Hebrew to the Greek, is the same word that Luke uses. And then he says something interesting, and you got to catch this. For no king has had a different beginning of existence. So what is Solomon telling us here? He's saying that no king has had a different beginning than being put in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes was a sign of kingship. See, we think of swaddling clothes, and we think of this big old huge blanket. We're just going to, or, or loose clothes. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what you think. I don't know what you think. I, I have different things that I think about when I hear, hear the word swaddling, right? But here's the thing, is that Solomon makes it clear. Solomon was going to be the future king when he was a baby, that the swaddling clothes were a sign of his kingship, and Luke taps into that. Luke notes that Yeshua, Jesus, is wrapped in swaddling clothes, just like, Sh- just like Solomon, to show that this infant is a king in the line of David. He's a king in the line of David. 
And Luke supports this thought later in this chapter when the angel shows the connection between Jesus and Solomon when he speaks to the shepherds. This is why the, the angel says this to the shepherds. This is why he talks about swaddling clothes. So the shepherds would understand that this baby was God in the flesh. In Luke chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, I didn't give you this bear. Uh, to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Okay? He says, to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Messiah. So they're saying, look, this is him. This is the Messiah, right? And this is the sign. This is how you know it's him. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. The swaddling clothes constitute a sign of Jewish royalty, church, and an affirmation of Jesus' identity as a Davidic king of the Jewish people. It was prophesied that Jesus was going to come through the line of David. When you look at Matthew, the genealogy of Matthew, it's very clear. 14 generations to David, or no, 14 to Moses, 14 to David, 14 to Jesus. But David's there in the middle. David was the king. So what are swaddling clothes, right? What are they? Well, it's cloths and bands that are used in the practice of wrapping a baby. And in, 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 in a, the easiest way to put it is like making the baby feel like it's still in the womb. Now, here's the thing. A lot of commentators will tell you that it's these strips of cloth like they would use when people die and they would wrap them. That's not what it is. That's something totally different. And we're going to talk about that probably in the book of Titus. I'm going to, there's, there's something in there that I, I can kind of bring to full circle the thought. This wasn't that. The swaddling clothes was more like a foot to 18 inches width of cloth that, that they would take and they'd wrap the baby in. So that the baby would feel this comfort and, and this baby would feel this warmth. And we practice the same thing today with babies. I mean, we wrap them. I remember when we had our boys and mom would wrap them in a blanket real tight, like they're in a little cocoon and stuff like that. But the practice of wrapping them today came from this here. And here's what you need to understand. Most babies weren't wrapped in swaddling clothes in the time of this writing. That's why it was so significant what Luke was writing about the swaddling clothes. The swaddling clothes was a sign. It was a sign of deity. It was a sign of royalty. And Luke and the angel both make it a point to talk of this child in swaddling clothes. But there's one more layer to this that I'm going to break down for you. And then I'm going to close because this is a tr This is not the first story of a king in swaddling clothes. And what I mean is like a king in the essence of who God or Jesus is. There's a well-known story in Greek literature from the 8th century B.C., and this was written about 50 years after Solomon's death. And in a text called The Agony, it was written by a cat named Hesiod. Hesiod narrates the birth of Zeus, Zeus, to the goddess of Rhea. And after, after Rhea gives birth to Zeus, Greek mythology says her husband, Coronas, Attempts to eat the infant because he's afraid of Zeus and this future God. So in order to trick her husband and save her child, it's, it, it's, this is exactly what it says. Rhea wraps a great stone in swaddling clothes. And Cronus consumes the rock thinking it's his son. The story goes on to say that Eventually, Cronus vomits up the stone, but in him taking the stone and eating it, it gives Rhea time to get away with Zeus, and Zeus grows to defeat his father and becomes the supreme god of the Greek pantheon, right? 
Even this story, 800 years later, was still being told. How do we know that? Because the Romans were into gods. And because it was so much in the culture of the time, Rome ruled the earth. Chances are this story had been told numerous times to speak of Zeus's greatness. They would have known. They would have known this story. But Luke, Luke is a trip under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He echoes Hesiod's terminology, right? But he does it in a different context, and here's what it is. At Jesus' birth, there is no other deity to threaten him. To the contrary, Yeshua Jesus is Lord of all. Luke 2.11 says he's Christ, the Lord. And he brings glory to God in the highest. We'll see that when we get to talking about the shepherds in verse 14. So the heavenly sign of Jesus' swaddling clothes, listen, proclaims that this Jewish infant Jesus, not Hesiod Zeus, is the true king of kings. And Lord of Lords. Church, we have to understand what the Word of God is telling us, man. We have to go deeper. We need to dig and understand and find out why things are written in the Bible. I don't think any of us, including myself, gave it one thought about why Jesus was in swaddling clothes. I stumbled upon that. It's not like I'm some brilliant guy that, oh, hey, you know, I stumbled upon this. And I was like, hmm, this is interesting. What does it mean? And upon studying it, I was like, oh, my gosh, no wonder it was a sign to the shepherds. Right? The shepherds had to have known that this kid in swaddling clothes was a king of kings and lord of lords. And how would they have known it? Because they'd heard the story of Hesiod many, many times in culture. And now they can relate to it and say, ah, now I get it. But this is the real king of kings and lord of lords. This is why Jesus was in swaddling clothes, church. Listen. In closing, we need to tap into what's going on around us and understand what's going on around us and understand what culture is telling us, right? You need to understand what the culture is telling you today. Some of you are so bent out of shape over what's going on, you're missing what God is trying to tell us because God wants us to reach into the lives of these people and pull them out of what they're in. This is why I love the toy drives. This is why I love what my boy Wordsmith does, man. This is what he does. He goes into places that nobody else wants to go, and he wants to reach into their lives and their hearts, like we used to do on Halloween. We want to reach into these kids' lives and hearts. We use what's going on culturally to do it so that we can reach them with the life-saving message of Jesus. That's why. That's why we do what we do, and this is why we need to understand what God's Word tells us. The baby in swaddling clothes was a sign that Jesus was the true king and the true Lord. So, Father, we thank you for this word and this reminder of what what your word tells us as a sign of who Jesus is. People are always asking for signs. Well, here's one right here. The baby in swaddling clothes signified that this was the king, the true king. And so, Lord, as we go forward this month in this season, I pray that we wouldn't lose sight of the king of kings, <coughs> excuse me, and Lord of lords. That, Lord, as we enjoy the, the festivities, the fun of hanging out together, the parties, the food, um, the gatherings, Lord, the time of gift giving and stuff, Lord, that we would just remember that the greatest gift given was you and salvation through you, Lord. Thank you for my brothers and sisters this morning. I love them so much, and I know that you love them more. And I pray for abundance and blessing in their lives like they've never experienced this month. I pray, God, that you would pour out your love, that you would just pour it out in a way they've, they've never experienced, God. Lord, that they would draw closer to you and lean into you more. 
and that they would know that they're loved not because of what they do, but because of who they are. So thank you, Father. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friday night, 7 o'clock, right? 7, 7, 6, 7, 7 o'clock. Come get your eat on. We're going to be having a Christmas dinner. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a gift exchange, white elephant gift exchange. I love those because I like to steal. And so um, it gives me a, a reason to steal legally. <laughs> so. But it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I love it when we come together like this, man. And uh, so I encourage you to, to come do, do, what do they do, sign up? Or how does this work? How do we know how many people are coming? Please let us know. We're putting this on. We're paying for it. And so I don't want to have a whole bunch of food left over. Um, uh, we want to be as close as we can as far as, as numbers and things like that because we're not a rich church. So we need to do the best that we can. So anyways, have a fantastic week. Have fun. Deuces. <laughs>